Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Today we are going to be finishing chapter 8. This is week 9. Now, just to take you back to last week, remember, uh, we ended off with covering that document, right? That document that uh, was conceived, that was brought to fruition. Something interesting about the document was that it was not necessarily the product of King Ahasuerus, was it? It bore his name, it bore his seal, but it was not the product. It was the product, the contents, came from Mordechai, the Jew. Fascinating. Well, today, as we continue, as we finish out chapter 8, we're going to discover something amazing. We are going to see the effects that that document had, that impact. You're going to see it sent shockwaves through the whole kingdom, through the whole kingdom of Hasuerus. So we're going to look at see what that actually uh, looks like in this story. And uh, the prophetic insight that we're going to be given today is awesome. So let's just break right into it. Chapter 8, verse 13, let's go. A copy of the document was to be issued as a decree in every province and published for all people. I want to stop right here. It doesn't say for some people. It doesn't say for only particular people. In other words, the king didn't say, okay, shh, come here, my servants. Take this document, slip it quietly. Don't let anyone know under all the doors of the Jewish homes. Let them know victory is coming. Their enemies are going to fall. That's not what happened. We learn right here, it is published for all people. What did we learn last week? We learned last week that this document that was drafted, that was written, it's decreed, it's been put into law, was actually translated into every language under heaven. Every language throughout the whole kingdom, it was translated in. Well, now follow this. What do we know about the document, this document that was drafted? What was the thrust of it? What was the point? What's the primary objective of the document? If you haven't gotten it yet, let me tell you. The primary function of this document, it is a declaration of salvation to the Jewish people. That's what it is. It's a declaration of salvation to the Jewish people. Does this at all sound familiar to you? Because I know of a document, the Bible. It's been essentially translated to every language, to the four corners of the earth, under heaven. And what do we know about this document? I challenge you to read this. Cover to cover, and you will find it is a proclamation of salvation to the Jewish people. It's what it is. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that fascinating? That we see this very thing prophetically being spoken of. There's a deeper revelation here. And we continue to read, so it's published for all people, so that the Jews, listen to this, they would be ready on that day to avenge themselves on their enemies. Isn't that interesting? This document, it instructs the Jewish people to be ready. They're to be ready for a specific day, remember? It's a specific day, one day in particular, a day when they would in fact be saved, a day when their enemies would fall before them. Again, I ask you, what does this sound like? It sounds exactly like this document, like Scripture. All throughout the Bible, we find it telling us what? Be ready for the day. A specific day. Be ready for it. No, we don't know the exact day or hour. But over and over, it tells us, be ready for the day of the Lord. Exact same message being sent to us. Let me give you some examples. In Revelation 16, verse 15. Behold, I am coming as a thief. This is the words of Yeshua. I'm coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches. The ones that are blessed, the ones that receive joy and gladness of heart are those who are watching. Be ready for the day. This is what he's saying. And keeps his garments. And this is a term referencing that you're to walk in righteousness. And you can prove this later on in Revelation chapter 19. Uh, the, The righteous acts of the saints, this is what they've been clothed in, the fine linen. It was the godliness, it was the righteousness that they walked out. An absence of that, or if you were to say absence of the garments or embracing sin, you go back to the Garden of Eden. And what happened when they sinned? They saw they were naked. 
And what's he say here? Lest he walk naked and they see his shame. Let me give you another example. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 1. Concerning the times and season, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. One day. We are looking for that day. This is what we're waiting for. This is the expectation. It's the crescendo of this age. Waiting for the day of the Lord. Moving on to verse 3. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. What's so fascinating about this day, I want you to keep this in mind, it's a proclamation of joy and hope to one. It is death to another. Death to another. Going on in verse 4. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day, specific day, should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, listen to this warning, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. Let us watch and be sober. This is exactly the message that the document is conveying in the story of Esther. Be ready for the day. We continue on in verse 14. And we read, the couriers who rode on royal horses went out, hastened and pressed on by the king's command. And the decree was issued in Shushan, the citadel. So the decree is made, it's established. But now we have the matter of distribution. The distribution of the document itself. Notice that it was the couriers. See, it's the couriers, the king that delivered the document throughout the land. A document, mind you, which proclaims salvation to the Jewish people. Well, when you think about it, in the very same manner, the Bible does the same. The Bible's a royal document. It's been set out. It's been distributed by God's messengers, by God's couriers. You think of the prophets. What did they have? They carried the message of the king, and they brought it to the people. You think about the apostles, right? They did the same. They carried the royal message the decree of the gospel, and they brought it out. And they delivered it to all people. The Apostle Paul, he really captures this concept quite beautifully in his epistle to Romans, chapter 10, verse 14. We read the following. How then shall they call on him, meaning Yeshua of Nazareth? How shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. This is what the couriers of the Lord do. They bring a gospel, a beautiful gospel of shalom, a gospel of glad tidings of great joy. And this is the very scenario that is unfolding in our story in Esther. The king has sent out his couriers to deliver his message of peace and salvation to the Jewish people. We continue on in verse 15 in our story. So Mordechai went out from the presence of the king in the royal apparel of blue and white with a great crown of gold and a garment of fine linen and purple. And the city of Shushan rejoiced and was glad. Now, going back to things that we've covered, remember King Ahasuerus, he's metaphorically, he's symbolically representative of the God of Israel, the creator of heaven and earth, right? The king of glory, as we call him. Well, it only stands to reason that if his, he is a representation of God, then his place, his dwelling, would also be representative of that of the king of glory's dwelling. In other words, what I'm saying is Shushan, this city, is representative to some degree of Shemaim, of heaven. The only reason I bring this up is because I want to point out in this passage, notice there's rejoicing in the city of Shushan. The question is, why? Well, we're told that this joy occurs only after Mordechai comes out from the presence of the king. It's not recorded before. It's only after Mordecai comes out from the presence of the king, then they erupt in jubilation. Then there's joy. 
And here's the tie-in. When we read in Scripture about the coming of Yeshua, who was sent out from the presence of the Father, when the Word became flesh, the exact same thing happened. You cannot make this stuff up. In fact, I'm going to rename this series, You Cannot Make This Stuff Up. (laughs) Because you can't. You keep coming across this. Let me show you this. It's crazy. Going to Luke chapter 2, verse 8. Now there was in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Okay? So here you have these shepherds out there. And an angel is going to come to these shepherds. And this is what we read, dropping down to verse 11. For there is born to you this day, this is the angel speaking to these shepherds, in the city of David, a Savior, who is Mashiach, the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger, verse 13. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude, listen to this, of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. This is the very reaction that we see taking place in our story. Mordecai comes out from the presence of the king. The city of Shushan rejoices and is glad. The whole event is representative of the effect Yeshua would have on this world. And did. The people of Shushan rejoiced. They were glad because of Mordecai. That's the key. Because of Mordecai. Let me ask you a question. What did Mordecai bring? What did he bring? He brought goodwill toward men. He crafted the document proclaiming salvation to the Jewish people. And on a much deeper spiritual level, this is the very thing that the Lord Yeshua has done for us. Because of His coming, there's rejoicing, there's gladness of heart. Moving on to verse 16. The Jews had light and gladness, joy and honor. I find what is said now remarkable. In fact, I had to go quickly and run and read it in the Hebrew to make sure the translation was authentic. And I can tell you the translation is authentic. Let me put the Hebrew up. The specific part of this passage that I find remarkable that really drew my attention was the Jews had light. When you read this in the Hebrew, la yahudim hayatza ora. It is exactly what it says. The Jews had light. Now let me explain why I find this so remarkable. If we take into consideration the whole picture of what's unfolding in the story, we have Mordecai coming out from the presence of the king, therefore the whole city erupts in jubilation, and then we're told, now, now we're told that the Jews have light. This is exactly how it went down when the word became flesh and dwelt among us. It was then that the Jews, the Yehudim, had light. Look at this in John 1, 7. John records this. This man, meaning John the Baptist, came for a witness to bear witness of the light. Amazing. Yeshua is that light. The Jewish people now had that light. And the whole purpose of Yochanan the Immerser's ministry was to bear witness of that light. That all through him might believe He was not that light, meaning John the Baptist, he was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light which gives light to every man coming into the world. You cannot make this stuff up. This is what happened. Yeshua comes out from the Father. The kingdom of heaven is rejoicing. And now the Jewish people get light. Yeshua himself says, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness but have the light of life. The Apostle Paul continues this testimony. He says in uh, um, Ephesians 5.14, Therefore he says, and Apostle Paul's quoting Scripture. He's quoting Isaiah 26, uh, which is all about the resurrection of the dead, the resurrection of the righteous specifically. Therefore he says, Awake, you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Mashiach, Christ, will give you light. He is the light of the world. And if you're paying attention in the story of Esther, this is what's being conveyed. Yeshua is coming through the pages of this book. Remember what he said? You search the scriptures for in them. You think you have eternal life. These are they which testify of me. 
Man, you're getting that. Full force and effect. Yes, they do testify of him. The pages are covered with him. If you want any wisdom and understanding, when you go to the pages, you should be seeking Yeshua. Period. Seek and you will find. Now after Mordecai, he goes out from the presence of the king. We read the following in verse 16. The Jews had light and gladness, joy and honor. And in every province and city, wherever the king's command and decree came, the Jews had joy, gladness, a feast, and a holiday. Going back to my opening statement, you want to know how this document impacted the kingdom? Life-changing for the Jewish people. This is how it impacted them. They had joy and gladness. Their sorrow was gone. But now as we continue, when we finish up the rest of verse 17, now you're going to see how it impacts the rest of the kingdom. The Gentiles, if you will. Very important. How did this document impact the Gentiles who read about the salvation of the Jewish people? Well, let me show you in verse 17. Then many of the people of the land became Jews. It's that simple. (laughs) Then many of the people of the land became Jews. Why? Because fear of the Jews fell upon them. You want to know how it impacted the nations, the the provinces throughout King Ahasuerus' kingdom? Look no further. The document was so powerful. The document was so overwhelming. It was so compelling. It was so frightening that the Gentiles were flocking. They did not hesitate. There's nothing in this text that indicates any hesitation whatsoever. They came in by the droves to become Jews. What does that mean? Well, that means they no longer lived like they used to live. That means they now embraced the righteous laws that governed the Jewish people. Isn't that interesting? They embrace the righteousness of God, which means they had to abandon everything they were accustomed to. Everything. Their gods, their people. This is the effect that this document had on the kingdom. Isn't that interesting? Because we find that the Bible has had the very same effect on Gentiles throughout the world. It's a document that is so gripping, it is so overwhelming. Gentiles have been compelled for generation after generation. There have been Gentiles who have been compelled to become as Jews. To live according to the commandments that God himself gave to Israel. To the Jewish nation. And these Gentiles have come through confessing a Jewish king. It's an amazing story. Like none other under heaven and earth. Nothing like it. In fact, all you got to do to evidence what I'm saying is open your Bible up, begin with Acts, and find out how the Gentiles were coming in like crazy. We read in Acts 13, the Gentiles were begging the Jews to impart to them the message. The message that they were given. The message, the document that came from the document that prophesied a Jewish Messiah would come and he would save and deliver Israel. And now you have Gentiles begging that this message be given to them. They wanted salvation. Let me tell you something. If you want to prophetically understand the relationship that is supposed to exist between the Jews and Gentiles, you need to read this passage on the screen. And when you get done reading it, you need to go reread it again. Because this reveals what the relationship is supposed to look like. This story reveals the impact that should be happening upon those people who are not Jewish, who do not have Yeshua, but hear the message. This is the impact it's supposed to have on our lives. Now let me be clear. I'm I'm not saying that Gentiles need to become circumcised in the flesh, become fleshly Jews. That is not what I'm saying. I am not saying that you now need to abide according to Jewish tradition, oral Torah. I am not saying that. What I am saying is the Gentiles need to follow that which was given to Israel when they entered into covenant. 
And what were they given? They were given the Torah. Thus, we should be becoming, if you're a Gentile coming into the face, you should become a spiritual Jew. In other words, trading earthly wisdom for spiritual wisdom. Trading worldly understanding for God's understanding. Abandoning your understanding of what you think is right and what you think is wrong. For that which God states is right and wrong. Let me take you to Isaiah 55, verse 7. Let the wicked forsake his way. And the unrighteous man his thoughts. It's interesting, as this document's going out all throughout the kingdom of Ahasuerus, the Gentiles who are becoming Jews are doing just this. They're forsaking their wickedness. They're forsaking their ways, their, their thoughts. And look at this. Let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy on him. Because why? Because our God is a God of mercy. Our God is a God of love. It's up to you to go back and repent. The things that are plaguing your heart, that have overtaken you, that are drawing you into bondage, go back to Yeshua. I promise, He has the authority, He has the power to release you from these things. Awesome message. So He goes on and says, And the Lord will have mercy on Him and to our God, for He will abundantly pardon. It's been written. It's been written. You can take it to the bank. And it's been proven through the death and resurrection of the Messiah, Yeshua. Going on. My thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways, um, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Let me ask you a question. What are the ways of the Lord? I will tell you. It's really simple. Torah. Do you want to know what the ways of the Lord are? It is Torah. Go back and read Psalm 103 today. Read Psalm 103, and it says, He made known His ways to Moses. His ways He made known to Moses. They are His ways. Do you want to know His ways? Study the Torah. Apply the beautiful righteousness that is in there to your life, and watch what God does for you. Watch what happens. Unfortunately, this concept is a concept that is eluding the church today. The biblical concept of how Gentiles are supposed to be responding to the gospel message, it is being mutilated, it is being corrupted, and almost, and I emphasize almost, altogether being lost. Here's the tragedy of the situation. Very few people are picking up on this. And what we're left with is this plethora of confusion and various theologies touting that Jews and Gentiles, they need to be separate from one another. There needs to be a division between the two. I can tell you this, it is not the work of the Lord. This is the work of the devil. The devil has crept in. We all know this to be true. The devil has gone into the church and he's sowing seeds of heresy all over the place. He is sowing seeds of division. Perfect example of this is a theology that's actually being preached today. It is quite popular. And that is known as dual covenant theology. This theology that states, oh, the, the Jews have one way of living, but the Gentiles, well, they have another way. Oh, and then we're going to divide the Bible, and we're going to, the, the Old Testament, well, that's for the Jews. The New Testament, well, that's for the Gentiles. And I can tell you this, this ideology is from the pit of hell. This is being sown by the devil. The effects of this ideology, this theology, is the exact opposite of what we see happening in our story today. Exact opposite. Where Gentiles are coming in and they're becoming a chad, becoming one with the Jew. They're becoming as Jews. Instead of having Gentiles become as Jews, fully embracing that righteousness of God, we now see today's modern day church purporting separation. Purporting rejection of the righteousness that God has given to His Jewish people. And again, instead of the two becoming one, what is Satan doing? It's horrific. He is erecting, he is raising a massive wall between the Jew and the Gentile. Am I surprised at this? I'm not. And the reason I'm not surprised is because i actually seen Satan at work at this very thing, using this very tool against the church in the first century. Let me just give you a fragment of evidence. 
going to Galatians chapter 2, verse 11. Now, when Peter had come to Antioch, I withstood him to his face because he was to be blamed. And this is the Apostle Paul speaking to the Galatians of uh, his, his uh, fellow believer, Peter. For before men came from uh, James, he would eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he withdrew and separated. You have a Jew and Gentile being separated here, fearing those who were of the circumcision. This is exactly what Satan wants to do. He wants to divide us. He wants to divide the Jew from the Gentile. And I'm telling you, now is the time to restore what Paul calls the truth of the gospel. Over and over, the truth that Jew and Gentile have become a chad. It's the truth of the gospel. It's the truth that we see being played out in our story in Esther today. Let me show you, just textually give you an illustration here, to show you the effects. You want to know whether something is of God or not of God? Look at the effects. What is the fruit? By the fruit, you will know them. This is the fruit. You have Gentiles with this dual covenant, this separation. You have Satan coming and getting Gentiles to run away from the Torah, right? Run away from the Torah. But inversely, what do we have happening? You have the Jews running away from Yeshua because you got Gentiles running around saying, we serve a Messiah who did away with the law. It's a lawless Messiah. And the Jews are looking around going, that's not our Messiah. That is not who we serve. Our Messiah is Torah observing. He's coming to teach us Torah. What are they talking about? You want to know why Satan would try to separate the Jew from the Gentile? Look no further. This is the effect. It's what you would call a global killer in the church. It's a global killer. And because of how prevalent this theology is today, and because of how it's shaping our churches today, I want to spend some time looking at what the Bible, not what I think, looking at what the Bible has to say in regard to Gentiles becoming as Jews. And I want to begin by taking you to Romans 11. And you'll notice right here, this passage we're going to cover, this is where this banner came from. The whole thought, the whole concept of the banner comes from right here. For if the first fruit is holy, what is Paul referring to? The first fruit, this is Yeshua the Messiah. He is the first fruit. Read 1 Corinthians 15. This is a common term for Paul to use of Yeshua. And he says if the first fruit is holy, which Yeshua is, What's the effect of Yeshua being holy? The lump is also holy. Okay? And if the root, this is another term used for Yeshua, if the root is holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches were broken off, meaning Israel, Jews, descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Jewish according to blood, they were given the promises. They entered into covenant with the Lord. But if some of these branches were broken off, and you being a wild olive tree, specifically referring to Gentiles, they are not the native tree. They're not Jewish by blood. They're not actual descendants of Abraham. Okay? According to the flesh. They're from a foreign tree. If you from a wild olive tree were grafted in among them, and with them become a partaker of the root and fatness of the olive tree, you look at the partaker of Yeshua. Look at the benefits of being grafted into the natural tree of Israel. You become a partaker of Yeshua. And then he says the fatness of the olive tree, which is to state the promises, the blessings that was promised upon, that was spoken over Israel. The fatness of the olive tree was to be imparted to them. Now, you need to understand Paul utilizing this analogy to the Romans would have really struck a chord. This would have really struck home. And I say that because tree grafting wasn't something that was foreign. They practiced grafting trees together. This is something that they did. And what's so amazing is Paul takes a lofty, complex spiritual concept and brilliantly renders it down into the physical realm, giving the Romans the ability to digest and to understand this lofty spiritual concept. Simply by bringing it down, something that they physically have put their hands to, that they've seen, that they understand. Let me tell you something about tree grafting. When you go cut 
a foreign branch out to be grafted into your host tree and to the native tree. Branches have to be cut. And they're not just cut, but they're carefully cut. They're cut strategically so that when you graft this foreign tree in, there's grooves that it fits in. And what happens is the person who does the grafting, he wraps them together as one. And let me tell you something. When the rains come down and that tree grows, what happens? That tree, that foreign branch and that native branch, they grow together. To the degree that when you were walking around, if you were not the grafter, you wouldn't have not have noticed the difference. Because when the wind blows, all the tree moves. As it grows, it grows together. This is what Paul is conveying to the Romans. It had deep meaning to them. This concept of what a Jew and Gentile were supposed to look like becoming echad, you weren't to be able to tell the difference. But it, it is interesting, and this will come into play in the coming weeks, that when you do graft a tree and you wrap the bandage around, it takes time for them to grow together. Again, unfortunately, this is a concept that has eluded the church on a mass scale. And it's, you know, I got to tell you, it's almost hypnotic to me. It's almost hypnotizing to see how willing we are to sacrifice the totality of Scripture, the whole of the Bible, for a handful of verses, creating doctrines out of a verse in the Bible, which, mind you, the interpretation contradicts the rest of Scripture. It's hypnotic. It's mesmerizing. I'm going to go on record today as saying that the generation that you are living in today it is one of the most deadly and dangerous generations that has ever existed since the coming of Yeshua. And let me add to that statement, I am not talking about the world. I am talking about the church. We are living in a generation that displays a total lack of discipline in regard to approaching the holy word of God, something that is holy, Sound biblical exegesis has been replaced with political correctness. Sound biblical exegesis has been replaced with the dictates of our heart, how we feel. I will interpret Scripture the way it's good for me. Sound biblical exegesis has given way to intellectualism, to humanistic rationalization. All of these things have usurped the simple, plain meaning and intent of the Word. And you know what? The enemy loves it. He loves to have the Jew separated from the Gentile. He loves to see the Jew running away from their Jewish Messiah. And inversely, he loves to see the Gentiles running away from the Torah, running to their death. He loves to see it. Putting Gentiles in a situation where they're not able to distinguish or to decipher, to discern right and wrong, good and evil. So in light of this horrible reality, we're going to dig into the Word of God on a very intense level. And we're going to see what the Word has to say in regard to Gentiles, what they should look like, how they should be responding to the gospel message, how they should be responding to the document that has declared salvation to the Jewish people. I want you to see just how much Gentiles are truly called to be Jewish. And I think you're going to be astounded to see the amount of scripture that actually deals with this very topic. So with that said, I want to get back to Romans, but I want to go back to chapter 2. And this is what we read. Indeed, you are called a Jew. I want to be very clear here. Paul is not talking about Gentile converts. He is talking about his own fleshly brethren, his ancestors who actually stood at Mount Sinai. Indeed, you are called a Jew and rest on the law. What is he saying? He's saying the Jew is to stand on the Torah. This is what being Jewish is. You stand on the Torah and make your boast in God. What an amazing statement. You want to see how clever the Apostle Paul is as a teacher? If you don't study him carefully, you miss so much. I just want to give you an idea of how brilliant he is. One of the things we talked about is all things are established on the testimony of two, correct? 
gospel, did you know that he just laid out the structure of the Jewish faith? In this very first sentence, you rest on the law and make your boast in God. Have we heard of this before? Uh, yes, we have. Read Revelation 14, 12. Here's the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Yeshua. Revelation 12, 17. The dragon's enraged with the woman, goes to make war with the rest of her offspring, with those who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Yeshua. And what does Paul say in the very first sentence? You will rest on the law and you make your boast in God. He just put a pair of bookends. He just established the Jewish faith, the structure of the faith. Amazing, right? He's brilliant. And then he goes on and says, and know his will. How many of you want to know the will of the Lord? This should be absolutely at the top of your list as a believer in Yeshua. You should want to know the will of the Lord. There was no hands raised on there. I am not doing my job. I am failing. How many want to know the will of the Lord? I mean, seriously. If you can't raise your hand in here, you're not going to raise your hand outside. We need to know His will. And Paul says of his Jewish brethren, you know the will of the Lord. You approve that things are excellent. How do they do this? Being instructed out of the law. Unbelievable. You want to know what the will of the Lord is? You want to know why? The enemy would come in and strip the law away from the church. God forbid that they know God's will. And that they do what pleases Him. It's the will of the Lord. I want you to notice here what Paul is doing. Just in this front part of this passage. He is literally outlining the glory of Israel. He is outlining the blessings of Israel. The wisdom of Israel. What makes Israel Israel? He did in this short passage. All of these things that Paul mentions here is what sets Israel apart from the rest of the earth. Rest of the nations. Paul is literally, he's putting Jew on a pedestal. He is lifting that term Jew up on the highest pedestal, rightfully so. And then he goes on to define what it means to be Jewish. One thing we need to understand is that the law of God And listen to me carefully. The law of God is intricately woven within the tapestry of the Jewish DNA. In other words, to understand what it means to be Jewish, at least from a biblical standpoint, you need to understand what it was that was promised to them. You need to understand what was given to them. What was given to the Jewish people? Torah. The Lord's righteousness. The Lord's commandments. And this is evidence right within the Torah. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 32. For ask now concerning the days that are past, which were before you since the day that God created man on the earth, and ask from one end of heaven to the other whether any great thing like this has happened or anything like it has been heard. Meaning no one else has experienced this. Did any people ever hear the voice of God speaking out of the midst of the fire as you have and heard and live? You remember the Mount Sinai? As they're coming into covenant with God, what happened? The Lord descends on Mount Sinai in fire, and they hear His voice. It frightened them quite literally to death, to the point where they say, Moses, let not God speak with us, lest we die. You speak with us. What did the Lord speak? His law. It's what they heard. This is what it's referencing. Moving on to verse 34. Or did God ever try to go take for himself a nation from any other nation by trial, signs, by wonders, by war, by mighty hand or an outstretched arm, and by great tears according to all that the Lord your God did for you in Egypt before your eyes? Verse 35. To you it was shown that you might know the Lord himself is God. There there is none other besides him. Out of heaven he let you hear his voice that he might instruct you. Did you catch that? The reason he spoke was to instruct them, to give them instructions. They are instructions of life. The word gives life. Read the Psalms. It's powerful. And so he, out of heaven, he let you hear his voice that he might instruct you. On earth, he showed you his great fire and you heard his words out of the midst of the fire. 
So what happens here is instrumental in understanding what it means to be a Jew. They're people of covenant. Covenant. God made covenant with these people. They are people of law. Not just any law. Not a law designed by Moses. Not a law designed by them. It's the law of God. This is what makes the nation of Israel so special and so beautiful. So appealing to those who fear God. It's appealing to see this. Further proof, Deuteronomy 26, verse 18. Also today, the Lord has proclaimed you to be His special people. This is going to be very important as we continue in the coming weeks. Proclaimed to be His special people, just as He promised you that you should keep all His commandments. Did you get that? To be special. What makes them His special people? That they may keep His commandments. Again, I tell you, the law is intricately woven into the DNA of a Jew. It's imperative we make this connection so that we understand exactly what is happening in our story in Esther where we have Gentiles becoming Jews. Did you understand what it is that they would be doing and this, what this conversion would look like? Now, getting back to Paul's discourse in verse 17. Indeed, you are called a Jew. You rest on the law. You make your boast in God. You know his will and approve the things that are excellent. Being instructed out of the law. Moving on to verse 19. And are confident that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness. This is an amazing passage. Paul speaking to his Jewish brother and says, you are supposed to be a light to the babes, to the blind. You're supposed to be a light to them. Well, how could they be a light? Well, let's just think about this for a second. Psalm 119, 105. Thy word is a lamp unto thy feet and a light unto thy path. Again, in Proverbs 6. The commandment is a lamp. The law is a light. What did the Jewish people have? The law. What would they be? They're supposed to be a light to the nations. This is what he's saying here of his brethren. An instructor of foolish, a teacher of babes, having the form and knowledge and truth in the law. Now, so this is the glory of Israel. Paul really defines what it means to be Jewish. The beauty of the Jewish people. He articulates it brilliantly. But now he's going to move on into what it looks like when you fail to do this. And this is where we're going to come back to what it means what Gentiles should look like when they come into the faith. Moving on to verse 21. You therefore who teach another, do you not teach yourself? You who preach that a man should not steal, do you steal? You who say, do not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? Isn't this fascinating that Paul's going through this litany of the very words that his people heard on the mountain coming out of the midst of the fire. It's going through the heartbeat of Torah, the Ten Commandments, the Aseret HaDevarim. He's literally going through this. Uh, Verse 23. You who make your boast in the law, do you dishonor God through breaking the law? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you, as it is written, for circumcision is indeed profitable if you keep the law. But if you are a breaker of the law, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. Now, 23, 24, and 25, Paul mentions something, and it is scary, that if a Jew breaks the law, Something happens, and it should make you weak in the knees when you break the law. What happens when you break God's law? You blaspheme the name of God. Now, why would a Jew be blaspheming the name of God? Because here's why. Because God pulled them out by an outstretched arm, and he came into covenant in the sight of the entire world. He came into covenant and gave them a set of laws by which they were to walk by. God put His name on the table for the sake of the Jewish people. And then, what we read about here, but if a Jew goes out and doesn't do what he agreed to do in the covenant, what happens? He blasphemes the name of God. Scary. Horrific. When you think about, do you believe that you come into covenant with God? Through the faith in Yeshua, it's the only way to come into covenant with God. If you've come into covenant with God through faith in Yeshua, are you blaspheming His name by your actions when you go to work? 
when you go to the grocery store, when you talk to your family members uh, who you're impatient with because they're a bunch of pagan heathens. Are you representing Yeshua in love and in truth, spirit and in truth? Or are you carrying that holy name upon your lips and blaspheming it? That makes me weak in the knees. That makes me fall down and go, God, save me. Save me from myself. Save me from my flesh. I am stupid. My flesh knows no good. Nothing good in my flesh dwells. Moving on to verse 26. Therefore, if an uncircumcised man, who are we talking about? We're talking about Gentiles. If an uncircumcised man keeps the righteous requirements of the law, mind-blowing. Gentiles coming into the faith through faith in the Messiah Yeshua, and Paul identifies if they keep the righteous requirements of the law, will not his uncircumcision be counted as circumcision? Which is to say, they become Jewish. Gentiles becoming as Jews. Cannot make this stuff up. Verse 27. And will not the physically uncircumcised if, here's the big if, he fulfills the law. How many times do we read about fulfilling the law in Matthew 5, 17, where Yeshua says, I've not come to destroy the law of the prophets, I have come to fulfill. Play roo that's the Greek. And then Paul says it again in Galatians. You love your, for all the laws fulfilled in one word, even in this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And here he says it again. If the Gentile fulfills the law, will he not judge you who even with your written code and circumcision are a transgressor of the law? Verse 28. For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly. In other words, in the flesh. We're not fleshly Jews. Nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew. Go home and read it. He is a Jew. He is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, not in the letter. What does Paul mean, in the spirit, not in the letter? Well, exactly what he said here. The letter does say, go to Genesis 17. You're to be circumcised according to the flesh. But what is Paul talking about here in regard to the Gentiles that are being grafted in to the tree of Israel? He's saying their circumcision isn't according to the letter. It is according to the Spirit. And go to Colossians chapter 2. In Him, meaning in Yeshua, you have been circumcised with the circumcision made without hands by putting off the body, the sins of the flesh, by the circumcision of Messiah. You think about the power in that statement and exactly what Yeshua did at the cross And what is supposed to be happening with Gentiles coming into the faith? It's exactly what we read today. We're to start becoming as Jews, living in God's righteousness, not blaspheming that holy name to which we were called. We can bow our heads. I'm going to close in prayer. Lord Yeshua, we just come uh, before you humbly uh, with thanksgiving. Uh, we are to enter the courts with thanksgiving, into the house with praise. We praise the name of Yeshua. You are worthy. You are holy. Uh, You are so worthy of honor. And uh, we are not, not one of us, not all of us together, are worthy of the sacrifice that you made for us. It is beyond awesome. And we just give you praise for showing us compassion, for showing us mercy that we don't deserve. And Lord, I pray that you reign your Holy Spirit in us. Put your Holy Spirit upon us, an anointing that is so heavy that we do not go out and blaspheme the name of Yeshua through our actions, that we fail to walk in the faith or that we compromise the faith in any way. But we stand strong. We stand as soldiers of the Most High God being empowered and strengthened through the name and through the work and through your authority, Yeshua. Strengthened by who you are. We know if we depart from you, we can do nothing. Uh, But through God, all things are possible. Lord, with Shavuot coming upon us tonight and tomorrow, we pray for the outpouring of the Spirit. I pray for your power to reign in this place. I pray that as people repent, Lord, as I have personally experienced and I testify with my mouth, 
As I repented, I was healed years ago. And I didn't ask for healing, but I was supernaturally healed only because I went and confessed your name and confessed my sins. I pray for that power to come out. Lord, pour your spirit out on this place. People who are sick and ailing, let your spirit fall upon them. Let their sins be forgiven. We yearn for your power, Lord. We yearn for your mercy, for your righteousness. And we have failed. We have failed miserably. And we have been weak. And we have been impatient. Not waiting upon the Lord. Not waiting upon you. But moving in our own ideologies. Moving without you moving before us. Because we're not waiting for you. Making mistakes. Falling into sin like King Saul. Well, Samuel doesn't come. Then I'll just take care of matters on my own accord. Lord, I pray that you give us a heart that is not anxious. Do not give a, we, do, we know you don't deliver an anxious spirit. You give peace and shalom to your people. I pray we have the faith to wait upon you. <clears throat> so we just pray for your blessings, Lord. We pray for spiritual uh, manifestation, spiritual gifts, Lord. We pray for compassion and encouragement in this place. The people that are hurting, Lord, let them be comforted. God forbid that we are not a community that lifts up those who are hurting. We just pray these things in the mighty name of Yeshua.